much needed because it's much bigger than the past. It's much bigger than China's Kansas City. It's happening properly. And we really have to start bringing the pieces together, if you will, to be able to let folks know what are you doing in your city to be able to provide them with that solution. So again, I want to thank everyone for coming in um, to the show. And uh, Grant, I think I might as well say something now since those burgers are growing and they're going to be great. Yes. Hey, could you take a few minutes and uh, cut my door today so we can have a real uh, hello, everybody. My name is Graham Christensen. Uh, there's a lot of familiar faces out here that I see already, but also it's encouraging because there's a lot of new ones. Um, we're trying to get environment on the radar a little bit more across the state, and so this is part of some of our efforts to do some pretty cool things, I think. Um, I work with the Nebraska Farmers Union, and we're a nonprofit that's been in the state since 1913. And what we do is we work to try to um, fend for family farmers and ranchers all across the state of Nebraska. So here in North Omaha, there is a deep history of working with the farmers that I think we've lost touch with a little bit, we've forgotten. And just as I think a lot of generations of people have started to forget a little bit about where their food has come from, um, you know, uh, this is a common trend all across. And so we've lost touch of how our food is actually made. So what we're trying to do is be, bring back the educational component that shows, you know, actually how food is raised and reconnect people with, with their foods. And so um, the burgers that are going to be here today um, are actually grass-fed. Uh, they, they will be finished on corn. Um, they don't use antibiotics. They don't use steroids. Um, or, any, or any of those kind of components that is a more typical or common thing found in a lot of people. <coughs> and so we're trying to figure out ways in the Farmers Union now to be able to work with our urban partners and try to reestablish um, some of these relationships that we feel we've lost uh, between the farmers and the consumers. Um, just over the last year, uh, for the first time since I've been working with the Farmers Union, um, and in recent memory, the Douglas County Farmer Team has reestablished itself. And this is because of the urban farming movement that's, that's kind of sweeping across the, the country. And it's because people are starting to, once again, um, ask where the food comes from. And it's, it's a really beautiful thing. And so there's an opportunity to do things to be able to reconnect people with this. And I think that as we move into the future, if we can continue to ask these simple questions like where our food comes from, uh, besides being able to produce food in, in different ways, uh, whether it's, it's in a community garden, uh, just right around the corner, or whether it's you know uh, a farm right outside the town, um, I think that with that comes more opportunities for new infrastructure created locally. Uh, whether that's through uh, transportation, whether that's through meatpacking, like this, this community uh, once had such a strong hold on. Um, or whether it's from just producing the food in, in many different ways. Uh, there's so much opportunity that can, that can empower community through, through finding out and learning where our food comes from. And so the Farmers Union supports family farmers. Um, the Farmers Union is side by side with the Sierra Club on many of these environmental issues. So we're going to try to be working with, um, uh, with, with folks like these to try to make some of this stuff once again become a reality. Uh, so uh, with that, I just really hope you enjoyed the food. Um, it was donated from uh, Jim Knopic, who has up uh, North Star Neighbors. It's a cooperative out by Fullerton, Nebraska, and he was just tickled, um, tickled to death that, that we were able to make this connection today. Uh, he also, um, hopefully I'll be able to bring him around sometime, but, but he also donated uh, seven extra pounds and on top of the discounted price uh, to make sure people can start tasting the, the quality of foods again. Because the one thing about it is everybody deserves to know, and they deserve to make the choice that they want. And hopefully, you know, through uh, enhanced education, we'll be able to figure out how to uh, make this happen in a, in a cleaner way. But enjoy the food. It's really good burgers, and I think you'll notice the quality, the, the quality of the product uh, when you taste it. And, and I think we have enough where folks can probably go up and, and grab an extra one. So as we continue the meeting, um, we, I will be grilling outside grilling and bringing in food, and so just kind of look to the back, and, and when you see me running around the back of burgers, uh, feel free to come back and help yourself. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you for all you guys are doing, and uh, yeah, I look forward to
to uh, the rest of the afternoon. This given right here, um, 16 out of the game or one. Um, I can't talk about him enough. He's a visionary. He actually came up with the concept of uh, actually going after the game. Low power station. Well, actually, that was tacked on the Eagle Brown. He tacked on, actually, I said a prayer. Next day, he tacked on a pier there. And, uh, so now I don't need it. After that, we just manifest. You know, we concrete. Uh, my man, Larry Bradley, he believed in me and gave us, you know, gave us some funding uh, to help Ashley get one of our first transmitters. Uh, right now, we're on the AM dial, and Ashley would broadcast it live. Right now, we're streaming live. Uh, so if you go to 1690am1.com, uh, and you can roll out, baby. You know, that's how we do it. Um, so I'm blessed. I'm, I'm very happy that you guys came out to um, listen to all the dignitaries that we brought from, from around the country uh, to talk about this issue. Um, we're just going to be moderating, so hopefully we'll put some smiles on your face uh, at the same time while we gain some knowledge. So I appreciate everyone coming out taking the time uh, today. And then when we leave here today, we're pretty sure that we tell uh, uh, 10, 20 people uh, so we can magnify this issue. Uh, we appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, again, we broadcast a lot, so like we said, uh, we use using social media, uh, tweet, uh, Facebook, let everybody know that we're here, so, so they can uh, listen to this dialogue, because, you know, we all want to be sick and shut in. Everyone don't have transportation, so we can't forget those that, that, are, that are less fortunate. So uh, in order to uh, uh, make sure that we spread the knowledge, we're going to start it right now. So also, you know, mm -hmm. I need to get in. That's my name? I'm nervous, man. I'm on TV all the time. <laughs> uh, William King, uh, I'm the station owner, founder. Um, oh, everybody, everybody has a smartphone in here, right? No. Okay, baby, well, we're going to learn today. So today is the day of learning anyway. Um, we're on a tune in app. So if, if you got a smartphone, go to your, uh, your store right now. I got time, I got time right now. Because the birds are cooking, uh, go to your stores and just down to N F T U N E I N radio and just download the app is free on all platforms and just search 1698 one. We appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you for the prayer for the senator. Uh, what's going on? What's going on? No, I'm going to bring uh, a gentleman that I've been around for a while. I don't need a normal introduction to you. <coughs> Um, I, I first met him in um, a, a Democratic function, and he was very, how should I say, outspoken about some serious issues, all the way from white clay to uh, why the Democratic Party needed to have more people of color in the party. And he had this long hair, and I couldn't figure out you know, why we allowed this, this, this young <laughs> to get up there and talk the way he did. And then um, I saw him organize. And I saw him take a lead on a lot of issues that a lot of folks would not, would not even touch or address. And he came to uh, Omaha and he said that we were a sleeping giant. And he just it stuck with me for a long time. And I couldn't understand what he meant by a sleeping giant. The fact he was talking about that in order for us to accomplish what we need, we have to come together. We don't have the numbers like in bigger cities uh, for, for black folks to do their thing or Latinos or whatever case may be. In Nebraska, we have to come together as a, as, as a people and as an organization. And we said that if we would ever realize our true potential, our true strength, the unity. And um, I'm talking about none other than uh, Mr. Frank Lemire. So if you take a minute and a pause to uh, invite Mr. Frank Lemire to the stage, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.
think uh, Willie a good introduction. And William, I thank you for your good work and, and uh, just continuing to do what needs to be done for the community, for the family, the extended family, for the people. That is extremely important. You know, in preparation for coming here today, I had uh, talked to Graham and I talked to a number of individuals. I tried to get a feel for what they want and what people wish to do for their communities and for their families. And try as I might, I realized several days ago that I cannot understand, I cannot grasp what you grasp because you live here. You live, you work, you breathe here. And your families, you do the best you can to live, to grow, and to flourish. And I do not know, you know how I can share things with you that would help you in that regard. And so I thought it was fitting and appropriate yesterday that I took some time and I'm going to share that with you. As we do among the one available people, I decided it was very important that I offer up an invocation, offer up a prayer, offer up a petition uh, to the Creator. And, and I took some time yesterday to put those things together and to get that, uh, that long, uh, that, 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 Want long sheet down in together, that in the tobacco, and some other offerings. And I took those, I gathered those up yesterday afternoon, and I went to a very sacred place where I've offered up many petitions, many prayers for family and for others. And I went to that place uh, just outside of Sioux City, Iowa, I Bluff, and I put down my offerings. And I ask a humble and fervent prayer that I be allowed to strive for humility and that, uh, that I be able to offer up a very pitiful petition and that petition be heard. And what I asked yesterday was that I be able to come here today and touch you in your hearts and in your minds, that you would be able to touch others in their hearts and in their minds would cause them to pause and to perhaps try to understand what you would share with them about your wishes for your family, your extended family, for your community. So I put down that tobacco yesterday for all of you. And uh, I believe, as we think that there's, in our lives, much is preordained. And even our gathering today is preordained. And there's a reason that we're all here, and there's no coincidence that you're here. That you came here to share something, you came here to take something. That you directed all of us to be here. And that's extremely important. I have come to know in my life and my work that much is preordained. I find myself many times in different venues, dealing with different issues important to the people. And I stop uh, and sometimes small ask myself, what, what can you tell me to do you to and they used to stop and around and say, what's this all about? And I quit that many, many generations ago because I'm not smart enough to understand what it's about. We are not smart enough to understand what it's about. But we know and understand and trust that much is preordained and we simply, for Mauna, for Tukashi, the Creator, we do those things that have been set out for us to do. And I've lived my life that way as best I can, and that brings me over here today. Willie mentioned, uh, and I'm going to share this with you as you begin this initiative to try to make things a little bit better in the community. As you would raise issues in your community. Willie had mentioned white clay. And that effort there that we began many, many years ago continues. Do the best we can to stop the illegal flow of alcohol onto the dry Pine Ridge Indian Reservation because our state uh, brings much devastation uh, to them through our sale, pretty much unregulated, of alcohol onto Pine Ridge. That is something that uh, has bothered us for many years and we've worked very hard on that issue. Hundreds, if not thousands, now or even 
aware of that issue last week. It's a little known fact you don't read it in the newspaper. I addressed some of the captains of the liquor industry last week in Washington. The 200 attorneys who comprise the National Alcohol Beverage Control Association met because they want to talk about regulating the industry, trying to make uh, the sale of their product uh, beneficial to people, try to meet the need, but also to be responsible. <coughs> and they invited me to, to go there last week, and they talked about two places in the country that have caused much consternation to the liquor industry. One of them was downtown Seattle, Washington, where the unregulated flow, so to speak, of alcohol devastates mainly uh, black Americans. Hispanics and Native Americans, very devastating pocket for hopelessness in downtown Seattle. People came from Washington to talk about that. The other place they talked about, wanted to hear about, was White Clay, Nebraska. And uh, they wanted to focus on that. And I found it interesting and ironic that these captains of liquor industry know about issues here, but our own state does not know about these issues. Or perhaps they know about it and just do not talk about it. I believe that as you begin your efforts to try to change things in and around your community, there are certain things that you have to understand about the work before you, about what you need uh, to get done. Our efforts started the new at White Clay a number of years ago. I want to mention this to Willie. Where did this start? Because I went through there one time in 1998, early in the morning, saw many of our people asleep on the street, on the highway, fighting one another, all intoxicated. I drove through and shook my head, went to the Pine Ridge and took care of business and waited that night. I came back to them, there was perhaps 80 individuals, all inebriated, many fighting one another, many of them passed out in the hot sun along that short three-block area just on the Nebraska side of the border. And where that effort started to do was me and my San Tisu relative drove through there, and he was driving, and I looked as we went through there very slowly. It had been a long day, and I said very simply, Somebody needs to do something about this. It was quiet for a long period of time. So somebody needs to do something about this. We drove on into Nebraska. It was quiet. It was a hot day. And perhaps two or three miles down the road, my sanity relative looked at me and said, Frank, you should know better than that. What's wrong with you? If you uh, feel strongly about it, you're going to have to do it. Nobody cares. You are going to be the one to have to do it. And very simply, I remember that first discussion we had 15 years ago. It very simply, you're probably right. You're probably right. And that issue started with one individual who took ownership of something, who said we have a better way. And that work continues today, and ultimately we will win. Ultimately we, we will prevail. I wish to say that we probably already have, because I believe we probably could save somebody's life last night. We caused somebody not to be abused last night. We caused a wife not to be beaten by a drunk fool husband last night. And that's what our effort is all about. I want to share with you as you begin your issues in and around the Omaha area. Starts with one. Starts with that majority of one among you who said, well, somebody needs to do something about this. And then they need to stop and realize very quickly that nobody's going to. If you want to change something, you have to do it yourself. And, and I think that's very important. I want to convey that message to you. Uh, 
It's not a new message. You hear it all the time, but we don't think about it very much. You want to do something, you want to change something, you're going to have to do it yourself. Earlier today, I met with these partisans out here, these Democrats. We had a meeting, a little bit ago, and we talked about some issues. And in this third district group, I mentioned something to them that I want to share with you, because I told them I would share it with you today. You had some concerns about environmental justice and about uh, the environment. I mentioned that when we work toward change, and I would have all of you hopefully think about this, when you work toward change, uh, what you do is you invest a lot of time and energy. And as I mentioned to those this morning, what you do is you accumulate a lot of road dust. I said when I go into that parking lot, I look at all those dusty cars. And I have a lot of respect for them because they've acquired road dust. They've invested time, treasure, energy, what they have to work toward change. And when they do that, when they have invested 15 years at White Clay, many, many other years dealing with social issues impacting Nebraskans, Native and non-Native, and impacting Native people, what happens after a long period of time, and many of you know this, you gain, through your investment, some moral authority. And I want us to think about this and remember this, and even talk about this if you can. You gain some moral authority. In our society, uh, we do a lot. We elect leaders who work in the public trust, who work for you. And we elect them, or we appoint them, and we give them some moral authority. Sometimes, uh, we uh, hear people make mention of it. I have the authority to this, and I have the authority to say that, and I have the authority to act here. And we try to know that and understand that, but we see all of it uh, to be moral authority. And some of us... Many probably have that moral authority. And some of you probably even say, you know, uh, William, I got that moral authority. Willie, I got that moral authority. I got it. Every now and then somebody even throw it in our face. Yeah, I got the authority to do that. There's a discussion we have about moral authority. I think that's so important in North Omaha right now. Because of late, as I get older, things get simpler. As one gets older, you become just a little bit more uh, thoughtful in your approach to things. And when I thought about that moral authority, you know, and, and I deal with many issues, I've come to understand that I gained some moral authority because I've invested something, I feel strongly about something, and I'll speak with some moral authority about an issue. But I have always said, and I've always felt, that with that moral authority, there comes a moral imperative. I want, to think, I want you to think about that. With that moral authority comes a moral imperative. What good is it if we give elected leaders, we, what good is it if we take moral authority and we tell everybody, I got moral authority? What good is it? It's nothing. Moral authority is nothing without a moral imperative to act. I have come to that place in my life where I try to understand that. That if I invest in time and I feel strongly about this, then Frank, if you feel you have that moral authority, show me. Show us. And act. Act for the families, for the extended families. And as you begin efforts undertake to change things in and around North Omaha, I think I want you to think about that moral authority, that moral imperative, and think about that majority of one that you are going to have to be as you work for change. I believe that's extremely important. I mentioned that one 
uh, becomes older, they become just a little bit wiser. And I've worked now, dog on it, I'm going to say 42 years for change. I hate to even do the arithmetic on that. I don't like to do the math. But in one way or another, I've invested 42 years, you know, uh, for, for change, trying to work for something. I've used every avenue, every form, and worked for change every way that we can, one-on-one -on -one or in the state house or even in Washington, work for that needed change. And I have come to find out something that nobody ever told me. They should have told me this 41 years ago, but they didn't. And uh, because they don't want to talk about it, we don't want to talk about it, I don't even want to talk about it. But you're going to be working for environmental justice, you're going to be working for environmental change. And one thing that I'll share with you, just from the start, as you begin your initiative here, our particular initiative in North Omaha, that nothing changes unless someone is made to feel uncomfortable. Nothing changes unless somebody is made to feel uncomfortable. I have found that. I've tried everything. I beat my head against the wall and I come to that place where I've understood that nothing changes unless someone is made to feel uncomfortable. And nothing changes until you make yourselves uncomfortable. It is human nature for us to want others to understand us, to respect us. Human nature to have others look at us appreciatively at us. Human nature to want people to respect us, to even like us. That's what human nature uh, tells us. And but at the same time, we have got to understand those feelings, know those feelings, and make ourselves uncomfortable by asking tough questions. Uh, many in the positions who can change things for you. Nothing changes when somebody is made to feel uncomfortable. Nothing changes until you make yourselves uncomfortable. These are just the rules of the road if you wish to change things to make things, you know, just a little bit better. I want to, you know, share that with you. Yesterday, when I end, we must act. Yesterday, I went and I put down that tobacco at the very sacred place. But we must act all the time. And where I went to put that tobacco is a place that I've gone to all the petitions and prayers for my health, for my family, for others. I take great care there. And when I went there yesterday, offered up prayers about what we want to do and what we want to talk about with the environment and the community. I went there and I looked down and where I put that tobacco, all of, because it is the, the seasonal change, all of this is brown and there's weeds there. Or no, there's not weeds, there's dried brush. And I looked at that very sacred place and it was full of ear bottles, and whiskey bottles, and garbage. So I talked about how we need to do things to change the complexion of Mother Earth just a little bit. I went to offer up those prayers, and that's what I've seen. It was windy yesterday. It was hard to get around up there, but I resolved that on Monday I will ask my son, perhaps I'll give him tobacco, and have him come with me. And we'll go to that block and we'll clean that up. Because how can we talk about these things in the world where we cannot deal with these things right here? So I would do that you know, on Monday. I would ask all of you to do that. If we're going to talk about changing the face of our Mother Earth, it starts with ourselves. And that, I think, is just a challenge to you. Somebody is here from Fullerton, they tell me, very 
Euclides were there. Fulton is the ancestral home of the Pawnees. They are now exiled in Oklahoma. The first Nebraskans live in exile. The Pongas, many of them returned. They left in the first march. The Pongas and the Pawnees are exiled in Oklahoma. We don't talk about that too much. You don't see that in your history books. Very important that we think back and we think about the Omaha, the Lakotas, the Pawnees, the Ponkas, the Santees, and now the Winnebago's who came here because there's something that historically very important to us that is we work to change things in the environment. When all else has failed, we should go back to the beginning. And the beginning dictates that we remember something, and that was that it was the indigenous people. It was the native people who first consecrated the ground on which we live and grow and flourish. It was the Ponca and the Pawnee who offered up petitions, asked for bountiful harvest. Ask for protection from the elements. Ask for the sun and the rain so that we could live. In exchange for that, they determined that what they would do is they simply told the Creator that in exchange for that, we will be good stewards of the land. Covenants have been made. And covenants must be respected. Me, in Fullerton and other places in the state have been blessed with bountiful harvests. People offer up petitions now, but those first petitions that brought us to where we are were made up by native indigenous people, many of whom exiled in Oklahoma. When we have this discussion about protecting Mother Earth and the environment, we must remember those things that covenants have been made and covenants must be respected. The Pawnee, I understand, took their uh, sacred corn with them to Oklahoma. A few years ago, it is my understanding that they took medicine bundles that were buried with many of their deceased because they wanted to bring back that corn which had sustained them for thousands of years. They brought some of those kernels and they worked with others. And they developed. And what they did was they took that corn that had sustained them for a number of years, these kernels, you know, 100, 100 years old and more. They took this corn and they did the, what they needed to do. They turned it to seed scientifically and they replanted it. In Oklahoma, didn't grow. They wondered about it, they studied about it, scientists looked at it and were perplexed. It is my understanding that soon after that, we were born in Nebraska farm. Who had heard about this and who had was aware of the Pawnees and even farms now on the ancestral Pawnee land contacted and sought to help. They took some of that corn and they planted it in Nebraska, the ancestral land of the Pawnees. And it is my understanding.
understanding that that corn grew. And I was told that it grew because it remembered where it came from. Very living thing. Remember where it came from. Covenants are been made. Covenants must be respected. But as you begin an initiative to work for that change, understand the importance of what you're doing. Know that there's no coincidence that you were here. Know that you've been chosen to do something to make a change that you'll probably never see. You'll impact somebody's life not even born yet. That's the nature of things. That's the nature of change. I told this young man today from the Sierra Club as he began, you know, his effort, I was aware of the fact that the Sierra Club was established in 1892. Also aware of my history that this Columbus went to the West Indies in 1492. There was a 400 year difference. I thought that was interesting and ironic as you talk about issues with coal-fired power plants and the pollution is caused. And as you discuss issues of renewable energy, I became very mindful as I heard about that 1892 date because I heard very recently that all of our fossil fuels will be gone in 400 years at the rate that we use it right now. All the fossil fuels that we have on the continent will be gone in that time. From the time that Columbus went to the West Indies, time that the Sierra Club was established. And that, that period of time forward, perhaps 10, 10, 20 generations from now, there will be no more fossil fuel. And those are just real simple things that the scientists tell us, and we never stop to reflect on, on that time. What is that? Very short period of time. Very short period of time as we you know, look at history and as, as we look forward. There is much to be done. I uh, enjoy issues of the environment. I remember a number of years ago taking on uh, the Blue Natural Resources District. I remember taking on uh, the Lower Elkhorn National Re Natural Resources District in fights with a number of individual non-native people who sought to protect the land and to sought to keep state government from using eminent domain to take them from their land. And I fought for a number of years, many years ago, and I don't know how that fight continues now, because sadly it looks to me that if we have money, every NRD wants uh, their own dam in their own county. Everybody has to have one. And I just at that time was concerned naturally about what we were doing for our Mother Earth and what we continue to do simply because we have dollars to do it. You know, time is short. I want to just mention to you that we're going to work toward change. And I understand that you're going to work toward change with the old people you need. And I want you all to know and understand with respect that they work in the public trust. And let them not forget that. Dog on it. Very recently, the NPPD up where I come from, I made them aware of the fact that you work in the public trust. When they decided that they were not going to fund a wind project on the Winnebago Reservation, I said, why is this? Why did we establish a moratorium just about the same time the Winnebago was wanting to take control? The new engagement, civil engagement we had with them, I think that project's going to grow. And I think it's, it's something that we all need to be looking toward. We are number three or number four in the country when it comes to the development of wind energy. That's our resource here. And I understand we're number 25, you know, when it comes to what we've done with it. 
think those are challenges that we have. I believe that the fight that you're going to undertake, the effort you're going to undertake here, is going to be very meaningful for you in this community, but also for the state of Nebraska, as they consider the development of wind. Maybe this needs to be the battleground. Maybe this needs to be the place where the effort, the true initiative starts, because it doesn't seem that we're too excited like we should be in the state of Nebraska about wind. Came to Minnesota several days ago. Oh, God. There's wind turbines everywhere. And I said, how come we can't do this? Well, I think we can. I applaud you in your effort. Good to be a part of this today. Just wanted to share with you those things about what you're trying to do. And uh, just let me leave you with, you know, uh, what I mentioned to you that continue to be the majority one. Make yourself uncomfortable. Make others uncomfortable in your doing this, not for yourself, but for the generations to come. And uh, there's no coincidence. You're all supposed to be here because somebody in here will also be the one who makes the change. I'm just trying to determine it so we know who that is. But you'll do a good job. Peanut Beat, thank you. I applaud your work and I applaud the work of those who come here to Malcolm X. And it's good to be here. I will be back here now that I know where it's at. So thank you very much. I mean, it's just, just listening to you, um, really a close understanding and magnitude of what we're trying to do. Been through a lot with you and you just been spoke. So, again, thank, thank you so much for coming down for your presence. Um, again, I, I've been on Frank for a long time. We actually marched together. I actually got a video, I'm going to show that video one day, so um, I didn't get the chance to march in the city because I was born in 1965. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I just want to uh, have all my panelists come up, so if you're a panelist, come up. These are our experts. Uh, we're going to actually talk about 10 minutes, we're going to talk about their background, um, what they do. Also, um, it's an opportunity, but let's take a little break, if you need to take a restroom break, um, we got food back there, so some of the work are done. We're going to get the counselors up here so they can get, you know, do anything. Because if some of the counselors are going to be asking sure people in here. Can't get that joke off. Uh, so we need to use the restroom for the mature people. Uh, that's the opportunity. Uh, we're going to also go back there and put the food, get a beverage. We're going to take about five minutes, and then we'll commence right back here. <laughs> Uh, uh, we want to do a quick correction. Ira Combs was supposed to be on the panel. Uh, his wife had an accident. Uh, most of you want to be all right. Uh, but make sure you keep ready to pray. Uh, Ira Combs will not be able to be here today. Thank you.
Three galleries still in here. Three. Could you come up here for a minute, please, sir? Are there any other candidates running for office? Uh, all right, then. We got the legs all together. Now you throw back to you. There is a snowstorm coming this way, so we want to get out of here on time. Uh, so if you can make your way back to your seat, we would really appreciate it. Grab that burger. Thank you. 
but the mining, processing, and transportation coal, diesel fuels, and trains, my estimate hanging around the train station must be a, a hundred car coal train that goes through Omaha to the east maybe every eight or ten minutes, something like that, maybe a day. And then, almost forgotten in this discussion of the risks of coal miners and black lung disease around which there's a tremendous history, there's risks to railroad workers, surface coal workers, and just from the coal itself, not just its combustion. But today, our concern, I think, is combustion and the North Omaha power plant. And there are really two levels of health problems we need to think about. So a little bit about what is in coal that causes a problem, then what kinds of health problems there are. First, it uh, releases particulate matter. And some of you as old as I am will, will remember the old days of sooty cities where you couldn't get rid of it. And we cleaned that up, but we're still emitting very, very small particles. Uh, the famous uh, uh, line around there is 2.5 micron width particles in the air, which are worse than the bigger particles because they get down deeper into your lungs and the alveoli and then carry the chemicals that are on them and with them uh, down that way. And there's all, it's a kind of soup of chemicals in this little combustible particle. Uh, so it's a lot like, and we need to remember this, tobacco, um, dust blowing around, say, North Omaha, that may well have lead in it, pollen, agricultural pesticides, marijuana, home furnaces, fireplaces, incinerators. Many of these are less problematic, but uh, actually if you're inhaling a lot of smoke, where's our tobacco grower here? Uh, I'm not sure whether if you smoke this tobacco, you might get more disease problems than you would from coal. So we need to have a perspective on these kinds of things. Um, but anyway, in that coal, uh, besides the particles, which are harmful, uh, there are sulfates, which are acidic. And it's funny, you read the public health book and say, well, that's not such a big problem because it dissolves in water and the mucosa in your nose and mouth, so it doesn't get down in the lungs and doesn't do such bad damage. But there are nitrates, which combine with other chemicals in the air to produce smog and ground-level ozone and possibly also in water, environmental estrogens that are an increase in problem. There's mercury, um, not very much of it, but it doesn't take very much to cause harm uh, to intelligence and development and acute attacks for tremors, rashes, itchiness, and big exposures are actually very serious. Um, it's interesting, you never hear about lead in connection with coal, and yet lead is probably one of the most hazardous environmental metals. And I think you all know that we are here in the lead superfund site uh, with uh, plenty of problems related to that. Um, and uh, ground level ozone um, being also a significant problem, especially related to asthma. So, so the, 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 there's a lot of chemistry in here that's a problem. And the kinds of health problems it's connected to, uh, well, it's connected to all the major health uh, diseases or diseases and health problems that kill us, uh, heart disease. Uh, cancer, especially lung cancer, uh, stroke, and chronic lower respiratory disease, which would mean things like emphysema and uh, COPD. But it also is involved in neurological problems. Um, the particulates are involved in affecting your ability to breathe and your lung volume. There are things like oxidative stress, which uh, um, stresses body inflammation. There's narrowing of blood vessels, which bad to circulation. Surely affects infant mortality and things like that. Um, and one of the problems is that um, death certificates don't say died of coal exposure or died of smoking. So there are all these things caused by uh, coal and smoking and other uh, chemical exposures like that. But we don't really have good statistics on how much of that um, is a problem. So, so I tried a little bit to say, well, how big a problem is it? It's, it's obviously a problem, um, and the connections are clear. Well, how many people say die from coal exposure? And people who look at it say, well, maybe there are about 50,000 deaths from coal in the U.S., uh, which is about 3.5% of those four major uh, diseases, uh, heart disease, um, lung cancer, um, uh, a stroke and um, I always forget the last one. Um, chronic lower respiratory disease. So, 
three and a half percent, well, is that a big problem or not? So we have to think, well, 50,000 deaths is on the order nationally of homicide deaths in the U.S., suicide deaths, there's somewhat more, traffic death rates during that range, diabetes death rates, there's a sort of 50,000 plus, plus or minus that's, um, uh, you know, roughly what we're looking at. So these are problems, those problems, those problems, these problems. Um, uh, from the Clean Air Task Force, which is a critical poll, they estimated in Omaha each year to make 20 deaths, 15 hospital admissions for various things, and 34 heart attacks. Um, they don't estimate the number of asthma attacks, but I'm not sure there's any more. So how does Omaha rank? Well, it's not way up there with the poll problems. Um, it has more than uh, uh, Lincoln in the ratings of, I think this is the national, um, uh, one of the energy uh, agencies, puts uh, Omaha on the hundredth in order in the list of cities with coal-related problems. Number one is the New York area, which has about 800 deaths to our 20, uh, 700 hospital admissions to our 15, and about 1,500 heart attacks to our 34. Lincoln ranks 230th, and Sioux City 254, and so on. Um, in Omaha, in 2010, there was about 34 murders, so 20 cold deaths, 34 murders, not actually hugely different. 2,200 violent crimes, and I don't know how many asthma attacks, and 20 fatal traffic accidents in 2009, about the same as coal deaths. So, two questions. No, I'm sorry. Are there things you can do besides closing the coal plant to look out for yourself? And I do have a couple thoughts about that that are, I don't think, well studied, but I think reasonable. One is, uh, when, when there's an inversion around here and the air gets highly polluted, which doesn't happen a lot, uh, then you need to be more cautious about going out. Uh, you might even want to wear, wear a mask if you're uh, checking it out and generally in good health. And heat extremes are going to be a problem increasingly at Omaha as time goes on, and the inversions are common then. Uh, if you have health problems, like you're overweight, you have respiratory disease, heart conditions, you want to be more concerned about this, because these things interact. Health vulnerabilities make you more vulnerable to these exposures. You can control your controllable health risks. It's not easy to do, but healthy diets, and there are healthy and expensive diets, but there are a lot of work. And uh, cost a lot of time. You can weigh down and exercise. And I know there are huge problems in North Dakota to find safe places to exercise. And you can drive safely and avoid driving. Although, again, there are uncontrollable risks to driving that come from other drivers and so on. Um, so these are kind of the personal, local, and individual concerns. The, at least from my own point of view, um, is that um, I'm a bit more worried about the long term. Uh, the big problem with coal is carbon dioxide emissions. I won't give you a lot of detail, but I think people by and now recognize that climate change is a growing and major problem driven by and large by human use of fossil fuels. And even here, we're just a drop in the bucket. Um, <clears throat> uh, Nebraska in 2010, put out about 74 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, uh, a lot of that from coal, of about 24 uh, uh, million metric tons. The world total, though, is 30 trillion metric tons, the U.S. 5.5 trillion. So the brass is only 0.002% of this global output. So I think part of what's going on here is we don't think we can solve these problems. In fact, we don't think we can do a lot to, among other people, to solve them because we want to participate in solving them. And we can solve two kinds of problems. One are the health effects of coal that are immediate, and the other, of course, are the long-term effects of worsening the global environment uh, gradually, but uh, absolutely. And the health problems of climate change build over the years. But we have heat events, uh, storms, droughts, tropical diseases that spread. Uh, migrations and very likely famines as the years go by. By 2050 or 60, people in Africa they may lose as much as 90% of the food production capacity. And if you listen to the people at the 
climate centers from Lincoln, we're going to have quite a few drought years in the next uh, 40 years, for which we'll, of course, need more energy to cope with. And if it's from fossil fuels, we'll just be amplifying the problem. All right. Um, <clears throat> indeed, as the time goes by, because these changes are so swift in generational terms and biological and geological terms, climate scientists uh, estimate that global warming poses a clear and present danger to civilization. And it's not the sort of thing we can wait until 2050 and see things go down. We really need to be working on this now, and we have to work on it everywhere. So that's the reason we go for uh, MDD, PD, LPPD, and the Keystone XL people, because more fossil fuels are really not going to solve the problems, and we've actually been increasing our fossil fuel use in Nebraska for some years now. We have to find other ways to deal with this along with everyone else. And this is not easy. But it's very, very important in the long run. People like, you know, if I go ask my women friends, well, who are the most vulnerable people on earth? They say, oh, well, women. And then I talk with my friends who are poor. And, uh, who are the most vulnerable people on earth? Well, poor. And uh, of course, and who are the most vulnerable people on earth? Yes, people of color, people of color. And you go on like that. Uh, I think it's our grandchildren that are probably the most vulnerable people on earth. So all of these things that we're thinking about in terms of health are really long-term problems. And even though they're long-term problems, extensive and difficult to deal with, I think we need to deal with it. So I have a kind of odd angle on environmental justice. It'll take me two minutes to go. And then I'll be to you. OK. I think we need to do what we can. And one thing we have to do, and people who are favoring economic development are not very much help on this, we actually have to overall reduce our consumption. And um, we can't just expand generating capacity by adding alternates like solar and wind. We actually have to cut fossil fuel use. So really, in the US, the people who are poor, not the poorest probably, but people who are reasonably poor in the US, are probably living well. And have it, anybody who has just enough they need are the only probably morally legitimate, justified people in the US. And anybody who has more, including myself, is in a way in a difficult moral position. Um, the people who are poor in the US by and large are globally, averagely wealthy. And the average way the globe can just about stand the level of cost of use of the field that we have. Anybody else in the US, all the people in the suburbs, all the people who work in the med center where I work, are just in a terrible ethical and justice position. So what Goes on here, of course, in North Oak, people have high access to damaging effects of an intensive economy, low access to health and wealth, are wrongly criticized for having less. less when actually, people around here need to be praised for being the most important contributors to the solution to the health problem of climate change, which is the main Many, many people. 
across all avenues, and that's what needs to be done. But when I was appointed to the Environmental Quality Council, it was a Republican governor that appointed me, uh, Governor Dave Heineman, but it was a Democrat senator who recommended me, and that was Senator Don Preister, and I had passed the legislature 39-0, and I'm sure Senator Cruz had to be one of the vote for me. But I was on the Environmental Quality Council for four years for the state of Nebraska, and ever since then, uh, Governor Dave Heineman has treated me like Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> and I, I, I say that proudly, I really do, because it, you know, you have to, I was actually for the environment. But give a little bit, when I, I'm looking at this uh, card that was given to me, and one of the things says, low income and minority populations that live close to the plant are disproportionately affected by the pollution and health risk. There's a term for that. It's called environmental racism. Environmental racism. I've known about that. I've heard about that. That's a, a term. And when I talk to my students, I sort of enlighten them from day one and until we go all the way through the semester. One of the things, coal plants in Nebraska, you know, one of those is a necessary evil. You know, I, I know Dr. Jameson gave a good, you know, uh, review of some of the history of coal in the United States, certainly. But when you look at Nebraska, there was some uh, coal plants in Nebraska, and legislation that they, the state legislature would try to, you know, get passed, and maybe sometimes they did get passed, and, and, and the coal plants that are supposed to be public utilities, you the citizen are supposed to be the ones that own these public utilities, not private utilities like some states, but public, and the OPPD, NPPD, and, and these uh, coal plants, the public utilities, their lobby group, you know, what they try to do is get, uh, they kick and, and scream and squawk and, and drag their heels and try to do the best they can, and this is my opinion, don't have to be years, that they do not include the type of technology needed that's supposed to be out there. And I, I remember, you know, talking about carbon trade and credits and such, and they were saying, well, let's try that, and then if we, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts, these particular corporations, utilities, private and publicly owned, will, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts, will uh, install scrubbers or a technology to clean up what's emitted from these coal plants. Well, this doesn't happen. And, and I remember sitting on the Environmental Quality Council in the mid, the first decade of the 2000, uh, 2000, 2010, and we talked about this and went over it again and again, and, I, and uh, it didn't happen. And here we are, it was just last year, that now that the Obama administration came in and his cabinet, the person in charge of the EPA, said, we're coming to you, Nebraska, and we're making you uh, clean up your air. And then they said, what? You know, we never knew this was coming. Uh, and meanwhile, Iowa put in uh, like 300 million, New Mexico, other states, they foresaw this and they foreseen. And, and so they, they cleaned it up and they created jobs, they created clean air. But in Nebraska, they kick, scream, swap, won't do anything, and they are hoping that Obama would have lost uh, to Romney, and then they could, you know, go another four years. So you know, that's what that's the way they do it in Nebraska. That's my opinion. It doesn't have to be yours. Uh, mercury trade. The the governor and I think the attorney general and some senators they they cooked up this thing where they're going to trade mercury credits, like cap and tra or, or trade carbon. And uh, I, I was on that board, and I said, look, if you trade mercury, I mean, mercury is a byproduct when you burn coal, very nasty stuff. Mercury, I, you know, the nastier is the carbon, but the immediate health effects. And, and the mercury, I'm trying to tell them, look, if you do this, we're probably going to get a lawsuit from a, a downwind state, you know, that we're doing this, and then this isn't right. And uh, if we trade mercury, they, you know, perhaps maybe Texas, if you think the uh, conservative axis north-south, and we're going to trade to Texas so they can allow them to pollute more. And I'm supposed to think, oh, wow, that, that feels good to me, that although some environmental racism or family or socioeconomic poor folks around the plants down in Texas, well, they can be polluted, but up here we'll be safe, and I'm supposed to sleep good at night, sleep like a baby. It doesn't happen, not with me. I wouldn't cross that line. So I thought, I said, this is not going to work. Well, they passed the law, they signed the bill, and two days later, a federal court struck it down. So I told you so, but the federal court had struck it down. And it just wasted the taxpayers' money, but it was, I guess, nonetheless, it didn't happen. And we dodged one there. Uh, 
just a couple quick things. Our Sarco, you talked about the lead plant. Uh, that's human lead. One of the things that I, you know, as a, not a big smart pants, I have two degrees in biology, a PhD in geography, but, you know, there's some things that are intuitive, especially when you have a, a degree in geography, and it was that, you know, look at our Sarco in this lead plant, and the Superfund site within Omaha, and the lead in the soil, and I remember there's these people, and it's battling back and forth in the media, the Omaha World Herald, trying to say that lead, uh, a lot of the lead that's, you know, in the children of North Omaha, Midtown, South Omaha, is coming from paint on the houses. And that was the primary source, and that was where you had to get at. Well, as a geographer, I'm saying, look, if you look at Kansas City, St. Joe, Council Bluffs, Sioux City, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, they all came up the same time as Omaha, moving the architecture, that time frame, they all have lead paint on the walls and on the houses. But yet Omaha was distinct than those other places at having higher lead levels in the blood of the children. And so that so what was so for you to say that it was you know the paint on the houses that is a factor and it is true, but it wasn't the wine, it was the lead in the soil. So when the EPA was trying to uh, go after Union Pacific and Union Pacific City had nothing to do about it, although they were trading and moving their freight and their product for a hundred years, you know, who stockholders and this and that was in on what? But it, it, somehow UP would have allowed it and the EPA was on my mind right to go after them to help pay for the super funding. Uh, uh, funding to clean up the site in Omaha. But that's just, you know, I give you the word on the street. Uh, that, you know, if you watch my show on Wednesday nights, a little we'll plug, 6.30 to 7 on Channel 22, Nebraska Geographic. I'll, um, and my final point here, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, what I see out here is something beautiful that you see, and it's very beautiful, it's, it's coming about. And I think of China, a lot of people like to blame China for things, but there's people like us in China right now that are mad. And there's an opposition growing there for the environment, that's what's going on in China, you know, at what price? And maybe we don't see as much over here, or the media in China, the government tries to not let you know, but there are people in China that are now, and when I have, you know, uh, students from China in my class, I do my best to try to create dissension with the government in China. <laughs> Just, uh, hey, I helped tear down the Berlin Wall, which is how I was trained. But, you know, and I think of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and that led to the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and that led to, the, you know, how the environmental uh, movement in the United States, red power, flower power, believe it or not, flower power. And so what I'm seeing here, and I hope I'm witness, witnessing this, this is a movement, and it's a second coming, a second movement of environmentalism, and certainly North Omaha, uh, all through all, we represent North Omaha, Midtown, South Omaha, hopefully greater Nebraska, and those, uh, the Farmers Union, the Organic Farmers, all of us, we've got to come together. There's a movement of farmers out there, I saw them, in, in outstate Nebraska. We're all coming together. And what helped, I think, the catalyst was the pipeline. We can get into that. But uh, I'll tell you what, it's, it's another movement, and it's beautiful to behold. So keep on keeping on. Thank you. Hey, I want to shout out to me and my man Larry. We play basketball together, so we just won a championship. I think we won a championship like five years in a row, so we did a hall challenge. Hall challenge. Hall basketball, right? Me and my truck. Uh, I want to thank a few students before, uh, especially my main man. Uh, again, I want to thank you guys for coming out again. Uh, also, what do you guys think about the beat? The beat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that we're going to be doing is, is bring some of that to the community. We're going to the rural, uh, with the urban. You know, that's how we do it. Uh, both areas are struggling, so uh, we're going to connect those two areas since, you know, since the IRB uh, don't want to uh, participate. We're making that connection ourselves with the farmers. Uh, because we, you know, we don't want to have a uh, Our next guest came down south, not too far south, though. About a couple of hours south. <laughs> uh, I met him, you know, for the first time. He was in a Cajun restaurant, you know, just dialoguing, eating. I don't know what it was. It was Cajun food. Uh, but I, mean, I, mean, I refuse to get 
he gave up when he realized he was ten times that many movements going on in this country, in this planet. Millions around the environment. Millions. They're starting in barrooms, in alleys, in bathrooms, in offices, in balcony X centers. And you can't have a leader when you have those kind of movements. There is no environmental leaders. Because there's not one thing. It's all different. The one thing I loved about your introduction was how many individual social organizations are sitting in this room right now. And each one of you have a different agenda. People call me an activist. I hate to work. Because I'm not. I'm an organizer, community organizer. Activists get living next door to each other. They have no idea what they're doing. Because they have an individual focus. And that's all right, they're supposed to be there. I'm not knocking anything, they're supposed to be there. Community organizers have to see it all. So what I'm doing is preparing the future generation. I'm preparing the people who you're working with. I'm, I, I put them, I make presentations, neighborhood groups. I got 144 neighborhood groups in Wyandotte County, in Kansas, Kansas. I am their personal green czar. In the process of me doing what I'm doing, I end up being the first black notice, it's not a lot of us involved in the environmental movement. I became the first black elected Sierra Club board member in the state of Kansas. <laughs> and also joined the NAACP and now I'm an NAACP executive committee in Kansas again. So I met with them because I want to personally form a relationship between the NAACP and uh, Sierra Club. Okay, I want to see, I want the NAACP walking around in the neighborhoods putting on these presentations that I'm doing. Do you know in our public housing, I can find this good, 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 in our public housing, uh, Johnson Control, the government under Obama's administration spent millions of dollars retrofitting the public housing. I mean, you walk in there, they put in windows, they put in lights, they did all that stuff. They put in smart meters on the walls, the can that cut off your heater in the wintertime when the house has a certain temperature, cuts off your air conditioning in the summer. I went to a meeting and a lady was explaining and they wanted to talk to me about energy efficiency at a board meeting, and a lady explained to me, a resident leader, that people are taking the meters off the wall in the wintertime, sticking them in the freezer, getting them cold, and putting them back on the wall. The executive director of public housing said they're standing in front of the meter with a lamp in the summertime, getting it hot, turn that air conditioning back on. And that, to me, is just like Katrina, a need for environmental literacy. See, we're not doing this because it's something that we feel we want to do. There's a reason. A man talks about fossil fuel. This book will educate you about peak oil and make you understand what that means. And yes, I agree 100%. We have to change our behavior. Okay? You'd be surprised. I say simple stuff like, you know, when you brush your teeth with the water running, you waste five to seven gallons of water down the drain. Depending on how many people in your family, they wash their teeth a day. In 30 days, you do the man. Or if you like my beautiful woman, I swear, sorry, I didn't mention you like that. <laughs> if you like my sweetheart, we used to do this. I can't say it about it anymore. They like to wash the dishes with the water running. 25 to 30 gallons is going down the drain. Now, who are you going to blame for that? That's on you. Uh, my, oh, my God, I love you to death. Uh, you spoke in ways that I, I agree with you 100%. It's our own responsibility. Yes, we got this problem with the coal fire plants. I'm glad you got involved. I hope you get your, get your, get your, your dandruff, dandruff up. But while you do it, once you get it going, I want you to look around and realize that's just one of many issues that we have to be concerned about. 
We got a new one coming up called Animoto. That's freight transportation. They're building a, every day they're building a, a, a nation, national hub outside of Kansas City called Edgerton, Kansas. Ships from China will be coming into, coming into LA, unloading their cargo on your, your guy up here's trains <laughs> that will bring that cargo to Edgerton where diesel trucks will come from the four corners of this planet to pick up that cargo and take it back to their towns. Kansas City, Kansas, and you might as well know this is going to affect you here too, has been getting a total of 50,000 truck traffic a day, I mean a, 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 a year. When that hub is built, it's going to increase to 50,000 truck traffic a day. Diesel fuel going through our neighborhood. Need I say what caliber of persons have those freeways going through their neighborhood? It's a low income. So our responsibility is to try to educate people, make them aware of what's going on. I mean, I'd love to have them all standing up and having fighting, but I want them to know to bring, bring, bring Johnny in tonight, bring, bring little babies in. He won't bring the band baby to my house this week. We got to start saving the people. So my responsibility is to make sure I'm thinking when we first started talking, you take the high road, I take the low road, and we'll meet each other down the road. That's kind of what's happening. But now, the end of this up, just to show you how serious it is, this is a picture of, of uh, what's his name, George Schultz. Okay? This is what they say. March 8th, President Reagan's former Secretary of State, George Schultz, visited Capitol Hill for the first time in two decades, speaking at a Partnership for Security American event to convince policymakers to add climate change as a matter of national security. This is serious, folks. It's very serious. And you know, I like to say it's not about us, it's about our children, it's about our grandbabies. You know, we gonna sit through because we live in a world of convenience. You know, we'll figure out a way to turn on, we'll figure out a way to make it happen. But when our grandbabies are grown, they won't have that luxury. You heard the man saying, I mean, gas is $20, 40 a gallon. You know, he said, you have to cut down and you walk it. They're going to have a different kind of life. The other thing I want to show you, this was on the front page, and I just brought it in. This is a core piece of ice that you took out of the ground wherever they take core piece of ice out of the ground. It's not my responsibility. Uh, what they found out is that the global temperature is highest in 4,000 years. And why is this important? I had a man die in Kansas City last year because of the heat. When the heat was 100 some degrees, full time, a week, or however long it was, a 72 year old man died in his house. In the last big snowstorm we had, I had two people die. They died because they went out and brought their generator because they were, the storm knocked out their electricity. They set the generator up in the house. To a 58 year old man, a 60-year-old man and his 58-year-old sister and their two dogs died of carbon monoxide. One block from the fire, fire station. Now, you would say, well, it was on the box, they should have read it. That's not a reason for bringing it up. The reason for bringing it up is to say the environment is creating circumstances that the people we love are having to deal with things that they are know nothing about. So I ask people, when it's hot, go check on your elderly. You know where they live. <coughs> people got pride. They're not going to tell them, do the bad. Go check on them. Take a bottle of water. We're going to have to start looking out for one another. That's it, folks. I'm glad I'm here.
talk about the disparities in detail and try to bring back to what has happened in North Omaha, the Osako led issue, and the more recent campaign to clean up North Omaha coal plant. Shut it down. If you have other Nebraska stories, feel free to share. You're welcome to talk about the climate change, but once again, talk about how this has affected Nebraska and local communities. Please relate everything back to these ideas. Environmental justice, the first and most common usage described a social movement in the United States whose focus is on the fair distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. Second, it is an in interdisciplinary body of social science literature that includes, but is not limited to, limited to theories of the environment, theories of justice, environmental law and government, environmental policy and planning, development, sustainability, and political policy. Our goal is to build a larger North Omaha environmental coalition. This venue is an outlet to educate new folks and get them involved in the coming weeks. These issues will be used to allow people to get simple. Last but not least, we'll bring on Mr. Graham Jordanson, who is one of the catalysts for actually putting this event on. And then last but not least, we'll have a few questions, and then we're going to have uh, a lot of time to uh, do the announcements. I see Robert Wagner in the back, and uh, it's important, folks, to hear Robert Wagner and what we have planned for tomorrow. If you're not aware of what is taking place, uh, I think a couple days ago, folks, uh, it is definitely a tragedy, uh, but it's nothing new. Uh, so uh, we'll take a few minutes before we close out to so, allow uh, anybody who has an announcement to come up and do an announcement. So Robert, please, tell me. Last but not least, I'm going to bring on Mr. Graham Jordanson, again, one of the catalysts for putting this on, to come up from the Zero Club.
uh, the way that they do, they actually um, they they import waste from other states around Iowa. Um, the waste I'm talking about is waste from coal-fired power plants. When you burn coal, you get fly ash, and fly ash has a lot of uh, toxins in it. And it, it uh, it's not you, you don't want to just throw uh, fly ash out uh, on the ground because, because uh, if it's not disposed of properly, it can leach into groundwater and make people's uh, water uh, poisonous. So we found out about this, and we started a movement on our campus. We had no clue what the heck we were doing. Uh, we got a couple of my friends together, and we uh, decided to make this an issue. And one day we went out in front of our library on campus, and we, we had a, a rally. We made a bunch of signs, and we, we stood out there, and we looked, we looked like goofballs. But, you know, um, because of that, every... Every media outlet in the state of Iowa came out that day. They heard about it. And we stayed out there, and they were calling. They said, we heard you're out there. We heard, we heard you make a noise about this issue. We've talked about this issue before, and nobody's ever done anything. Uh, no students certainly have ever spoken out. And they all came out, and they covered the issue. And within uh, six months, uh, the university had uh, look, started looking into new ways to dispose their ash. And before that, they installed water monitoring systems to find out if the rural communities where they were dumping this ash uh, were getting sick from the water. Because they were dumping this ash in northwest Iowa in an unlined, unmonitored quarry that the Department of Natural Resources uh, let them dump it there. And so after that, we, we were empowered. Uh, we realized how much power we actually had. And we decided to start a campaign to get our university entirely off the coal to invest in wind energy invested in solar energy. Since then, the university, uh, Iowa State University, has invested 20% uh, of their power uh, in wind. And um, OPBD has a 10% uh, a, a uh, renewable energy standard by 2020, I believe. Um, so, you, know, you look at Iowa State University, obviously not as big of a power provider, but um, you know, they, they got the political will after they heard from the students, after they heard from the people. Anyway, so the Beyond Coal campaign, we're here in Omaha now. We've identified um, some point sources of pollution, the North Omaha coal plant specifically. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pollution source. And anytime you have a point source of pollution like that in a community like North Omaha, um, after time, people are going to start to get affected by um, the, the contaminants that are coming out of the, the smokestacks. And, you know, as, as I've worked on this campaign and traveled around the world and worked to shut down coal plants or to at least clean them up, what we're finding are that it's low-income uh, people, communities of color, that live around these plants. And this is environmental justice, environmental racism. I mean, um, so we're working today uh, to start a movement. There's some new people in this room. When I got to Omaha, I was really, uh, the, the environmental movement uh, is, it, as, I, as I travel around the country, um, it's not, it's not that, that the diversity uh, that we really want in, in, a, in any movement, you know, and working here in Omaha, going to some environmental meetings, and no offense to some of my friends out there, I look around the room and it's people who've been in this movement uh, for a really long time, um, who, who, uh, who, who we all look the same, you know. So um, it was my goal to come to Omaha to work with uh, Willie Hamilton, uh, William King and others, and try and get this movement uh, into North Omaha, the environmental movement, to start working together to talk about these issues, to bring them out here to you folks. And from this meeting, what we'd like to do is we'd like to start a North Omaha Environmental Justice Coalition. We want communities, we want neighborhoods to start talking about point sources of pollution. I know of one, the coal plant, but I know there are more in Omaha. And I know that there aren't uh, there's not a lot of there's not a lot being done about some of these things. So this is our opportunity to come together to start talking about these issues, to, to figure out what some of the pollution sources are, and to work together as a community to solve them. So this isn't our last event. In fact, if you signed in back here, we have a sign-in sheet, and we'll be contacting people and letting them know. In the next two weeks, we're going to be putting together another forum. Uh, that's an opportunity for us to come together at a round table to start to talk about some of the environmental issues uh, that people want to see worked on in Omaha and then to start to figure out ways to achieve certain goals that we're going to set for ourselves. So, uh, 
If you haven't signed in, sign in. If you haven't eaten yet, there's a bunch of food. If there's leftover food from the farmers union, we have some grass-fed organic beef in the back. I'd be happy to give out um, that to anybody in the room who wants it. Uh, we're not we don't have enough for everybody, but we have little baggies a pound of hamburger meat. Uh, let me know, and I'll I'll get you some food before you go. And we also have a petition asking OPPD to invest in more renewable energy and to clean up the coal plant in North Omaha. Uh, at least focus on public health and, and, and understand what that means and work in, on a timely manner to get us, get us off the coal uh, so we can, we, can, we can start to think about some of the other issues we should, we should be working on. So thank you. Thank you all for coming out. And I hope you had a good time. Get some food, sign the petition, sign in, and we'll, we'll be talking all soon. Thank you. We, uh, we want to allow these folks to have a couple of questions uh, answered from the audience, uh, but we, don't have, we do not have to reinvent the wheel. The NAACP has uh, took the lead. <laughs> okay, um, and it's all about membership. So um, it'd be great to see our club and the NAACP be part of this. So, but it's about membership. And if you want to uh, get involved, you can contact the Vicky Hunt back in the back. And also Mr. Steve Jackson, who's over the here for me. Uh, so don't reinvent the wheel. Reinvent the wheel. Get involved. Join in on the Again, uh, we'll take a couple of minutes and then we want to open it up to a few questions and we're basically done. Robert Wagner, can you come up for a minute, please? Before Robert get up here, I want to. Uh, uh, one of the audience members we reminded us that tonight is Earth Hour, so at 8.30 tonight, you turn off your lights. At 8.30 tonight, for an hour. So, uh, go get your candles. Go get your uh, lanterns and all that stuff. Uh, so, tonight at 8.30, turn off your lights. It's called Earth Hour, so, so we can stay safe here tonight. Here we go, Robert. Oh. I'm on the Rock Wagner with Project Notes, and I wanted to announce that we're having a rally at 3 o'clock tomorrow at OPD headquarters. Can you hear me? Yeah. We're having a rally at OPD headquarters tomorrow to show support for the family. That was assaulted Thursday night, and one of the things I wanted to point out was for too long, you know, all we hear is internal affairs are going to do an investigation. But there's a union that protects them, and we never get the answers. You know, we never find out what the investigation or what was concluded with the investigation. So I feel like at this time, you know, as a city community, we have to come together and demand action. You know, we need an auditor. There's an election going on, so I'm hoping somebody that runs the office can show up and help support this cause, help support this family. And if we all work together and come out and show that we care, no. you know, maybe we can finally get something done. I won't keep any longer. Thank you. 3 p.m. OPD headquarters. Bring your signs, cameras, anything. No, no, uh, and um, Robert is the founder and um, the, the founder and the president of Knows, which is Chief of the Law. Thanks for everyone. And if you, if you, if you don't recognize Robert, Robert was a gentleman that was beaten by 15 police officers. Uh, went to court, won, won the case, case but uh, that wasn't good enough. They came at him uh, again. And uh, what even more was clapping the paper, they actually had his officers back after they were terminated by the chief of police. So uh, now we have another case uh, beside Leo Lewis, and now we have the Johnson family. And if you haven't saw the video, please go to Facebook and take the video. I, I know we have to wait until the process is taken care of, but uh, if you blind the student, uh, that you cannot see what took place and why would it take over 25 to 30 officers to be able to, to apprehend uh, three individuals and to be able to walk into a house without any such one whatsoever to do this. Um, and uh, I see Lisa. Um, I want to thank her, um, one of the first individuals uh, we had this, this rally of this support uh, she was there. Men, 
we got to be the one that step forward. We can't always count on our women to be the one to lead the story. The fact of the matter is, man, men, we have dropped the ball, we really do have to pick up the pace. Robert Wagner has given us a great opportunity to be able to come in and do something about a problem that's been taking place for years, for years and years and years. So let's get back to the close of this. Uh, again, we would like to have three guests sit down, and I know some questions that you guys may want to answer or have any time to feel about and give these individuals an uh, opportunity to answer those questions. And again, I want to thank the National Day Foundation for all the students that are doing all the individuals that have been doing this phenomenal event, including 1690 AM, the one. You want to have any questions? Now that since we had our meeting last Thursday with OPPD, uh, what are the following plans for that uh, follow-up? Oh, I've seen your name all around town. How you doing? What, what, uh, what I was referring to is, uh, you know, OPPD has a board, and they have a board. And uh, they have a board, and, and once a month on a Thursday, it was this, this last Thursday, and we had some folks come out to talk about public health issues, to talk about uh, climate change and how that relates to the North Omaha station, and we had some people speak. And I think Ronald's asking, uh, what's the follow-up from that? You know, I mean, these board meetings offer an opportunity to give public comment, and uh, and I, from what I understand, only being here for about a year now, at one time um, these board meetings lasted uh, maybe 20 minutes, uh, half an hour, um, but now they're lasting longer. And you know, I mean, the public power district, when they give us an opportunity to come to these board members and uh, give public input, we're stakeholders in the process um, around North Omaha, around Fort Calhoun, around. Um, you know, all of the things that they do. So we came out, uh, the NAACP was there, they presented a report uh, that looked at the North Omaha station and, and determined that it's an environmental justice offender. And I believe uh, from, from that meeting, I think uh, the CEO, Gary Gates, has uh, planned some follow-up meetings with them. So um, I don't know, we'd have, to, we'd have to talk to, I think, uh, Vicki Young has left already. But, uh, I, you know, we'll we'll know soon, and, and we'll we'll figure out follow up on that. So, um, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment, and uh, I was able to say it to Dr. Bradley before he left. The comment that he made about the lead issue in Omaha was actually very incorrect on some levels. Um, and the issue that I that I'm most concerned with, I'm the executive director of the Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance, we're a lead poisoning prevention and healthy homes organization. And the issue that I have is that statement about children being poisoned as a result solely of soil and people not being concerned about paint. The EPA is starting to delist properties from the Superfund site and their scheduled exit date is, is the end of 2015, at which case Omaha may or may not be a Superfund site anymore. I believe that our community, especially people who live in Eastern Omaha, are being left with a false sense of security thinking that if they get their yard done, they do not have to worry about lead. And we see this every day. Lead-based paint, in 90% of cases, causes a child to be poisoned by lead in Omaha. The statistics he gave were wrong. The numbers are for the other cities that he cited have the same levels of, of, of lead in our kids. Actually, we don't know because we only test 35% of our kids in the city. Anyway, I just want to make sure that people are very clear about that and that people in our community are not being given this misinformation anymore because I'm tired of it. Answering that because that's local, but I just want to say that's why it's important to educate your neighborhood people because people need to find out for themselves what's going on and not just sit and listen to what's coming from other folks. So I, I, I applaud you for doing what you do. I'm Mark Welch with the Brassens for Peace, and I was just wondering if somebody knows if we've got the largest Superfund site in the country getting rid of lead in eastern north, south, eastern part of Omaha. What's happening with the plant in north Omaha? They're continuing to pollute the land and the people, not just the people, but the land in eastern Omaha with more lead every time they're burning more coal. So how can we stop, how can we clean up something when we're continuing to pollute that land? I'd like to address that. Uh, but the 
preliminary, yeah, I forgot to say what Adam was saying. I'm, I'm the position of <coughs> social responsibility, which is a 50 year old national and international organization, which has been working on some of the graver health risks to face in the world, um, so the risk of nuclear war. And we can try to keep it well based scientifically, which, which puts me in a difficult position because I'm not a scientist. We have a new staff member here in our own uh, chapter. It's uh, Kim uh, Maher and Nassius. And Kim, would you stand up a second? He's had the privilege of working with this organization an hour and a half so far. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I hope you'll introduce yourself to him, and we have a little bit of literature you can give to. And we'd love to engage with you as partners at NACP and Sierra Club on these issues. Um, lead is not a big problem with coal plants. Mercury is strong. And hopefully we're cleaning up some of the mercury when we clean up the lead. Um, you mentioned some of the problems with the lead cleanup, the problems with the cleanup itself, and not just um, uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, the other sources of lead, which are also there. Uh, one of the problems is uh, in Wellesley, uh, they did a big study of lead cleanup in community gardens. In year one, they had the gardens cleaned up. Five years later, the lead was back. And why is that? Well, even though the EPA is cleaning up every piece of land they're testing, there's a lot of land still not cleaned up. Uh, and uh, as things get drier and hotter, that's when the winter around here, that will go around more and we'll see the lead resettle. So people need to be careful. Um, and uh, I don't really have the data on mercury, but lead is a very serious health problem. A couple other problems about the land, the soil to bring in, it's not soil, it's dirt, so it's not very useful to grow food. So you have to rebuild the soil. And the other thing, they allow some, like 200 parts per million, I think, of lead in that soil to bring in. Is it? No, that's the test for taking out. For bringing it in, 200 parts per million. Uh, in some states, that's uh, considered too much lead for gardening. And I think one of the things you want to do is go cooperate with gardening here in our shores. Any other questions? I think uh, Wood has get a question. Um, no, I just want to. I just want to acknowledge. Oh, okay. so we do have one more question in the back. Okay. I just, I just wanted to say on behalf of the gentleman that did mention about the lead and uh, the young lady's comments is that, you know, testing 35% of the children is not everyone. And another way that we can do our own statistics is to look at your own family, see how many of them have asthma, how many of them have respiratory problems, how many of them have cancer, how many of them have all these different diseases. We're not saying that the coal plant directly did all these diseases, but the amount of emissions that's come out of that coal plant since 1954 is a problem, and they use lead <coughs> in the early 1900s also. It is a problem. So me being a fifth generation Omaha and got over 35% of my family with respiratory problems, then we have to take the stance that this is a big issue, it's a big problem, uh, and then the SID deaths and the birth defects that's coming out, we're hardly making it out the womb, let alone getting old enough to shoot each other or rob each other. So there's other areas of this that we're going to be looking at too. So I just wanted to say that on behalf of the gentleman that said about the lead because this lead is a serious problem. Well, yeah, folks, we're going to wrap this up. Um, the gentleman alluded from Kansas City, um, education. Um, we are not educated about what is taking place within our community. And the information that we're getting is skewed. But please, this is not us against them. It's how do we come together, come, come, coming around to be a threat to this problem. And um, so do we have any members from OPD or any of those things out there? Uh, oh, uh, we want to make sure we say uh, thank you for coming out, because I know you didn't have to come out, but if you actually come out and engage in this conversation and dialogue, I hope we can have more. But it really isn't a us against with them. It's how do we work together to be able to have more efficient energy and to be able to find out what is actually taking place when it comes to the disparities within our community when you talk about asthma and other diseases. But the fact of the matter is, those are not preceptions. Those are reality that's happening and taking place within our community. 
And as a board member for the prison, we are looking at them, those areas under some of the ethnic areas. But it is an issue. So, uh, again, I want to thank you so much for coming out. And uh, whatever we can do to be able to work together, because that's what it's about, how do we come, come around and come around to address those problems. And again, brother, uh, I want to thank you, and I will be contacting you. You've got a whole lot of all those I'm sorry we run running be trying to beat that snow back in Kansas City. Uh, it's supposed to hit around 9 o'clock, but we figure we can get changed right quick and run out of here. We can get back down there and get that armory sleeping on the road on the road. Again, again, we want to thank you for coming out. Also, I want to thank you for coming out for the power company. Did you have anything to say? Did you want to say anything? Uh, you know, the only thing I want to say is I, I appreciate the fact that I was welcome here. Uh, and, and I guess what I would like to say is we hear you uh, and, and, and we know the concerns that are out there and we're looking forward to working more with all of the organizations. I, I think you heard, I know many of you from the board meeting, we've got a stakeholder process, we want to collect comments, we want to get it from the organization, we want to get it from our customer owners. Uh, I look forward to working more with all of you and collecting those comments and helping you chart our course into the future uh, to supply uh, power for Nebraska. What's your name, sir? And I'm, I'm Russ Baker. My name's Russ Baker. Uh, thank you, Russ. Appreciate it, Russ. Uh, again, folks, we're going to uh, close out. Thanks to the Malcolm X Foundation. And thank you to Graham Jordison and Graham Fitzgerald for putting all the fabulous events. Also, so much. we got more food, so if you uh, if you want to actually take some raw meat, you want to cook it, it's some spaghetti or whatever. Oh, give me some, man. Uh, make sure you talk to uh, my, my man, Graham Jorgensen. If you want to get some hot burgers right now, talk to my man, Graham Christensen. We got the Graham, we got Graham crackers in here, bro. We, 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 it's, it's, it's edible in here, isn't it? Fix the game as well. We broadcast the live. Make sure you have the team support, the Michael Max Foundation, the team support the environment, without a doubt. Thank you so much.
I saw you with your lights. This, I saw you with your lights, and I wanted you to see this one. This is the one.